questions and I will be doing the opening prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless this day. I ask you that everything will be all right, and that all this will pass over with grace and that we will all be okay. I hope that our elders and our the people that are young make it through this and everyone else makes it. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, to come before you, Lord, I thank you for this day that we can gather together in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. That we take this drink as the offering of your blood that was shed for the atonement of our sins at the cross. And we eat this bread in remembrance of your body that was shed for us at Calvary. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Good morning, everyone. So glad to have you tuning in today and hope you have your Bibles close by. We're going to read some really powerful scriptures today. So grab your Bibles and and let's get into it. If you remember, uh, last week we began a series entitled uh, Rediscovering Church. Uh, Since so many of us have been out of the cycle of gathering with the church on Sunday because of the pandemic, I thought it appropriate to uh, talk about church, to get a clear picture of what Christ had in mind when he said, uh, I will build my church. Uh, so to get a clear picture of what Christ had in mind, uh, I want us to see how Jesus says the church is about to be here, and then the church comes, and, and then the first church happens. Um, I, I love church, especially the church uh, I'm with right now, uh, but many of others I've been associated with. I don't know what comes to mind when you think about the word church, but Chances are it's a far cry from what the first church people thought or experienced. Uh, Now, I call it the first church because there was no Christ church before the first one in the first century. Uh, Nobody was bored in the first century with that first church. Uh, They didn't think about rows and pews and robes and hymnals and 
and bands and liturgy and and even Bibles. They didn't really have Bibles to start. Um, and then um, there were no banners or bands or, or all that hoopla stuff. It was such a different experience. It was uh, the, the church was simply a gathering of people who came together around one belief. That belief was this, that Jesus Christ was the risen Lord, the son of the living God. That was all they had. And that was enough. Now, as we keep Jesus' words in mind when he says, I'll build my church, uh, we want to keep one eye on that first church as we think about what Jesus wants of his church today. Uh, because of the pandemic over the past two months, many of us have not been able to, to gather at a church building. Uh, but because of our biblical background, we deep down know that we are still the church, even if we don't gather at the church building. Uh, did any of you feel as though they were not uh, still a part of Christ's church, even though you couldn't get together at church with the church? Uh, that would sound crazy. You're not, not a member because you can't worship right now. Uh, the church back then, first century church, it wasn't about a building at all. It was a movement. And, and it got a big start. Um, it, it started as a church of 3,000 people on the first day of that day. It was called Pentecost. Uh, so we're going to look at that in just a second from Acts. Uh, but first... I want to talk about that word church just a little bit more. When you see the word church in scripture, the word, the Greek word there is ekklesia, and its original meaning was the called out of the Lord, uh, called out of sin into being saved, called out of darkness into light, called out of being a lost person into a found person. That was the church people, the called out ones. So when anyone said the word church back then, they automatically thought about the called out people that were following Christ. Um, but the English term and the way we often think of the word today uh, comes from an entirely different place than that Greek word. Uh, we picked up a word from the Goths that was an East German tribe around, four, around the fourth century. Um, that word that they used, it sounded like kirch meaning the Lord's house or building. So phonetically in English, they use the word kirch to mean the place for worship. So the meaning of church, that is the called out people of the Lord, began to change and morph over the years with their influence. And, and so now when many say church, they think of the Lord's house or a church building. How many of you have ever said, I'm going to go to church today. That's because of the influence of the Goths use of Kirch. The church building is what you're talking about. But that's a bad translation. And it created some really bad theology. The church for many now has become a place rather than a people. And that's dangerous. Now, when that happened, when Christ's church was tamed and it began to, to reflect the building rather than the people, um, then the localized, regulated, controlled church was controlled by people who controlled the building. Whoever had control of the church building controlled the people who gathered there. Naturally, then, they changed Christ's teachings about worship, about who the head of the church was about salvation issues. They not only had a building that they had to control, but they had people that they had to control. They also had, as it developed, the Bible that they began to control. Few people back then had a Bible, and fewer still could read. Uh, so naturally, the leaders who had the Bibles and had the building, they began to control everything. They added to the scriptures. They subtracted from the scriptures. They did all kind of crazy stuff because they were in charge of the church. That went on for hundreds of years, and it digressed. But in the 6th century, a scholar named William Tyndale, 
did something bold. Uh, he's often referred to as the father of the English Bible. Uh, he translated and published the Bible in English from the original Greek and Hebrew text. That was scandalous because it gave away the power of the church and gave it to the people. They could read the Word of God for the first time themselves and not necessarily have to have any direction from any church. Tyndale once said to the bishops of the Church of England, who wanted to keep the scriptures out of the hands of the common people, if God spares my life one more year, I will cause a boy that drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you bishops do. In 1524, because of his development of the Bible to give it into the hands of the common man, he was under a lot of persecution. He fled from England to Germany, uh, where his first version of the New Testament was published and, and smuggled into England. Uh, Tyndale continued translating the Bible until a friend finally betrayed him, and he was hung and burned at a stake in 1536 by the powerful church that existed then. One of the things that drove the church leaders crazy in his day was that he translated ecclesia, you know, that word means church, the called out people, he translated that word very close to the original, which he said it's the congregation rather than the church building. He moved the idea of the church from being a place back to a people. And that's what made everybody so mad. Now, when we go back to scripture, back to Christ's teachings, especially in Matthew 16, 13 through 18, we want to read that. I want you to see now what he's talking about when he says, I will build my church. So this is Matthew 16, 13 through 18. And here it is. Now, when Jesus came into the disciples of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And he said, uh, they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, uh, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will build my church. He's not talking about a building, a facility, a, a temple, a synagogue. I'll build my people is what he was saying. Uh, they didn't really understand what he was saying. Uh, they were waiting on a new king for a new Jerusalem to overpower the Roman government. And that, in their mind, was, was all they could think about. It was kind of about, about them. They're going to rule in this new kingdom. Um, but he said, you know, in Acts, I guess I want to turn over there next, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father set by his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Power, awesome power. And what will you do with that power? Will you be my witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth? that's when the church is going to show up. So as they were witnesses, they were going to be testifying and referring to the fact that Jesus was alive because they'd seen him. And then because of that, they're going to make followers, make disciples of Christ and teach what he taught and baptize them in his name. That's what he said back in Matthew 28. I talked about last week. Um, they must have thought, how are we going to be able to do that? And who's going to listen? And so they got it figured out pretty quickly on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost was a Jewish feast day when the city would have been full of Jews and people from all over the world. When the Holy Spirit fell on the men in the room, uh, the 12 guys, um, and here was the evidence the Holy Spirit was on. They were able to speak in languages they had not studied. And with about 12 guys there, and just so happens to be there were about 12 different language groups in Jerusalem on that Pentecost day, and they each began to teach people in, in those groups in their own languages, and um, it was not a Jewish movement in, or message anymore. It was just for the whole world, and that's when Peter stood up 
and preached the first sermon in the history of the first church. That's Christ's church for the first time. I want to read that section to you. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 24, and then we'll go down a little further. Acts 2, 22. Men of Israel. Now, this is Peter. First sermon, first church. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him is in your midst as you yourselves know uh, that through him in your midst. Yet this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. You guys killed Jesus, but God raised him up. Now look at verse 32 and following. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. That's the Holy Spirit miracles that they're doing. Um, and then he, he quotes an Old Testament verse, verse 36. Now let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, that's Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, here were, were, was our question. We've sinned greatly by killing Christ, but he's re the resurrected Lord. What should we do? And Peter says, I'm going to tell you exactly what Jesus told me. Back, back, we have a record of it in Matthew 28, 19, 20. Go and make disciples and baptize them. He says, here's what you need to do to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of the sins. The word for is there to accomplish forgiveness of sins because you're joining with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's what this baptism we'll see was all about. Um, and those that were baptized that day, 3,000 of a big church, first church, first day. Uh, and let me tell you who made up the church. All those who believed in Christ as a resurrected Lord they were baptized into Christ. Now, sometimes people say, if you're out on only like big church, well, that day, 3,000 members became a part of Christ's church. That's big church on the first day. Just as Jesus predicted for his church, it was a gathering that rallied around one idea and only one idea, not a whole bunch of things they had to agree with. One idea. Jesus is the resurrected Christ, the son of the living God. Now, on that day, you couldn't go to church anywhere. There was no church to go to. Those people, all of them who believed and were baptized, were the church, the gathering, the called out of the Lord movement. It didn't matter what town they were from, what traditions they were keeping, what the name on their city temple was. The only thing that mattered was they believed in the resurrected Christ as Savior and that they were baptized into Christ. Today, 2,000 years later, it's the same. Anyone, everyone who believes that Jesus is the resurrected Savior and is baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins, as Peter put it, Acts 2.38, as Paul put it, Galatians 3.27, baptized into Christ, then you're a part of Christ's church. Now, back then, the church wasn't about location. There wasn't one. The church wasn't about style, liturgy, ritual, or statements of faith that members have to agree to in order to be a part of that church. There weren't any of those. The things that marked Christ's church was a person's belief in the resurrected Christ and their baptism into Christ. Here's Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Are we going to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, Paul says. How can we who died to sin live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him 
in a resurrection like his. That's why the baptismal scene is so important. Jesus, Jesus says, when you began to believe in me as a savior and you know about my death, burial, and resurrection, the first thing you're going to want to do is say, I want a part of that. I want in on that. And this is how you do it. You're, you're dying to your old sin. You're buried in the waters of baptism and you rise up from that watery grave. A new person like Christ rose from the grave. From that day forward, there's always been a group of people who keep the ideal the ideal. And what I mean is, this is what they focus on. Not all the trivial trappings of church stuff, but they say, we believe in Jesus as the risen Savior. And we are baptized into Christ. And because of that, we are belonging to his church. Those early church people, they refused to make it about a building. Since then, missionaries, Jesuits, church planners, evangelists, Bible translators, pastors, student teachers, uh, Bible smugglers, everybody. No, it's not about the people. It's not about buildings. It's not about allegiance to men. Um, it's about allegiance to Jesus Christ. People like you who give and serve and invite and cheer when someone is baptized into Christ, you get it. People who realize that when you gather in your home or your office or your church building, you're the church everywhere. People who realize that when you serve the poor, you're serving as a part of Christ's church. When you pray for the sick, you're doing that as a part of Christ's church. When you live out the values of Jesus and you feel like an outcast sometimes in your sorority or office or home, you are a part of Christ's church. Now, I don't know what comes to mind, what you feel when you hear the word church. But from now on, I hope you'll think a multiplying uh, people, a movement, people who believe that Jesus is the Savior and have been baptized into a relationship with him. So the question for you today is this. Are you part of Christ's church? Not because someone voted on you so you could be a part, not because you attend a worship service where somebody uh, has got a certain name on the door. Not because you jump through hoops to please church leaders in some church group or, or followed some catechism book. Um, but simply because you, one, believe that Jesus is the resurrected Lord and two, have been baptized into Christ. If you are, that's Christ's church. From day one, till today and forever in the future until the end comes. Those people who are believing in the resurrected Jesus as Lord and are baptized into Christ, that's the church. I pray you're a part of the church, his church, that will last forever. I pray you're part of that church today. But God bless you all richly. And goodbye. Day by day.